Good evening and welcome. Uh, I'm sure everyone out here knows me or thinks so. Uh, I'm Larry Hammond, interim superintendent here in Gallatin County, and I'd like to say thanks to you for your time, to you for your time and, and attending this very important event. I feel confident that the conversation and uh, dialogue will be very productive to those folks here uh, as decisions are made, and I think it'd be very important to the school personnel here as we look toward the future and working with you and your new uh, two found capacities. Uh, first of all, I'd like to um, welcome this group of candidates for both the Office of District Court Judge and Family Court Judge. Uh, from my understanding, there are several candidates in the one office uh, seeking the Office of Family Court Judge. Uh, as a former DPP and working with uh, family court judges as well as district judges, I admire both of you, both groups, for making the choice to serve where you are, where you've chosen. On behalf of the Gallatin County Board of Education, and we have three members here with us this evening, uh, Becky Burgett, Sonia Giles, and Hargis Davis. Don't think I left anyone out. And I appreciate them, but on behalf of the board, the school district, and the, the school staff, again, we can't say thanks enough for taking the time short notice coming and sharing your thoughts with us here on uh, this Monday evening. We realize uh, some of the many types of challenges you will be faced with hearing and consequently rendering decisions relative to our students and families. We admire your willingness to serve and cannot say that enough. I don't envy public servants. I think uh, I, I tell board members on an ongoing basis, I admire them. Um, no more genuine service to the community than being a board member. But you, you'll earn your keep as a judge in either capacity. I would also like to say thanks to Mr. Jones. Appreciate the work that he and his staff here at the Gallatin County High School have put forth to make this uh, a successful evening here. And especially to uh, Mr. Kevin Daly and his class for uh, really doing the grunt work and, and making the preparation to make the request of you and ask the questions and see that it's orchestrated in a, in a fair, timely fashion. In addition, I would like to say welcome to the audience, the parents, uh, some site-based members, some teachers, some parents, and uh, community members. We're thankful for the press being here, the local paper, and we'll be looking forward to a good article in relation to this. Positive, uh, positive for all, I'm sure. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Daly, and he's going to go through the format, and we look forward to hearing from you. Um, all right, guys, so the format tonight's going to be pretty casual, like most town halls you've seen in any election cycle. Uh, we'll go through a brief introduction from each candidate. They're going to explain their position and um, why they think they'd be a great candidate for the respective positions. And then we have a couple of pre-submitted questions that I'll ask, and then once we're once each candidate has a chance to respond, we'll open it up to community members, board members, um, anyone in the audience to ask questions as they will. Uh, without any further ado, let me try to work this out, and I'll just pass it down the line. Good evening. I'm Teresa Cunningham. Uh, thank you for having us here tonight. Um, I have been a litigator for 30 years. Uh, I have a law degree and also a master's in labor law. I've clerked for a municipal court judge in Ohio and a U.S. district trial judge. I believe my trial experience makes me uniquely qualified for this position. I know procedure and evidence, and I also feel that it should not take a year or two to get a divorce. I would like to see scheduling orders come out as soon as the petition's filed and get the divorces pushed through the, the process as soon as possible. Um, I live on a farm in Burlington, and I have water delivered occasionally, so I don't have city water. And I've been there for 19 years, and the man who delivers the water told me the other day, he said, I'm gonna vote for you because you have common sense. And I thought that was such a compliment. So thank you. Good evening, I'm Greta Walker, and um, I have been a family law attorney for the last 16 years. Uh, I've been licensed to practice law for the last 22 years, but for the first few years after I got my license, I was actually 
managing small law firms. Um, I had a business of my own contracting those duties out. I finally uh, went back to the practice of law in 2002, approximately, started out with my family's firm, and um, then went out on my own in 2010. The entire time that I have been practicing, it has been in family law and not any other area except for estate and probate, um, and aside from occasional little cases that you pick up for friends or whatever. Um, so the majority of my work has been in family law, and I've also been divorced. Um, the reason that I feel that is so significant is that uh, the majority, the large majority of cases in family court involves divorce and custody cases. And uh, included with custody, I would also include juvenile court cases. Um, when you've been through divorce, it changes your life, it changes the way that you look at the world, it changes the way that you think about things. And um, I believed that having the extensive family law background that I've had and the personal experiences with divorce and custody and remarriage and blending a family, I feel that I represent half of the adult population in, in Boone and Gallatin counties as Divorces make up for about 50% of the population, or 50% of all marriages end in divorce, I guess. So um, I feel like I'm one of every one of us, and I represent that common sense approach and that understanding of people that have been through those difficult circumstances in life. And I wanted to make sure that that perspective was there. Um, it's why I put my name in this race, and I hope that uh, I'll earn your vote tonight. Good evening, I'm Bonnie Rickert, and I want to thank each one of you for coming out tonight to learn about the candidates here. I have been practicing law since 2001, when I graduated from Chase College of Law, third in my class. And I just mentioned that because it goes to show that I have the work ethic necessary to sit on the bench. I um, work hard at everything I do. Um, I also have been serving on the Board of Education for Boone County for the past 12 years. So I've been working with our students and our schools as well as practicing law. Um, and through that experience with the schools, I know firsthand knowledge, the needs that our children have and the needs that the children here in Gallatin County have and how we can work with them to get resources to them and to help overcome you know, any issues that come out of the school system um, into the family court. I also know um, that they, the school issues go home with them and they have to deal with them at home as well, whether that be custody matters that their parents are going through with them or a divorce for their parents. So I have firsthand hand knowledge of that. I also um, am the president of the board for Go Pantry, which is a local nonprofit. And I just like to mention that so that I, people know that I care about overcoming obstacles for our, for our children and for um, our community and their families. So outside of my law practice, I also try to help out the community in other ways. I hope that you would vote for me on November 6th. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jennifer Dusing, and thank you for doing this. Thanks for coming. I'm, I'm glad that people are really interested in this race because it is an important election. Um, I am running because I care about our community. I care about the children and families in our community, and I want to do my part to try to protect them. And I know that given my personal and professional experience, this position is the best opportunity for me to do that. My personal experience, um, I'm a wife, I'm a mother, I'm an adoptive mother. My husband, Andy, is an assistant principal at Ryle High School. He's been an educator for 20 years. Um, we're both active in our community. I'm on the board of the Women's Crisis Center. Um, I have been for eight years. Before that, I was a runner with the Women's Crisis Center, so I would respond directly to incidents of domestic violence and sexual assault all throughout Northern Kentucky. Um, I've been interested in children, families, and the law since before I even went to law school. My first job out of college was as a counselor at a residential treatment center, and it was for children who had been abused and neglected, who had severe behavior and emotional issues, and as a result couldn't succeed in normal foster homes, so they needed round-the-clock therapeutic care. So I was a counselor for them, and in that job I saw I learned a lot, uh, but I also saw a lot of the problems in the system, I, in the community, and I, I knew I could do more. I didn't know what, but that path led me to law school. 
I went to the University of Kentucky College of Law and throughout law school I continued my focus on children and families where I volunteered at Prevent Child Abuse Kentucky, CASA, Court Appointed Special Advocates in Fayette County and the Fayette County Attorney's Office prosecuting abuse and neglect cases. Um, my first job out of college was in family court. I was a staff attorney in Boone Gallatin Family Court. And ever since then, I've been in private practice. I set up a law firm in Florence, and I've been doing exclusively family law. Um, so I've done you know, pretty much everything under the scope of family law. About 50% of my practice now is adoption law. I'm one of six attorneys in the state of Kentucky to be a member of the American Academy of Adoption Attorneys, which is a national adoption organization. And um, I was just endorsed by Northern Kentuckians for the judiciary as the most qualified of the six candidates. And they're just an independent, nonpartisan, nonprofit group of attorneys and citizens. Their whole mission is to try to improve and maintain the quality of judges in Northern Kentucky. And so they've um, evaluated and interviewed the candidates and endorsed me as the most qualified of the six candidates running. Um, like I said, this is an important election. It really, it's an important position. And this election determines who could be making potentially life-changing decisions for the most important part of our lives, our children and our families. And um, it really takes someone with the right family law experience, but also the commitment and sort of that judicial temperament. Um, somebody who will listen to everybody, who will weigh all the evidence, who will be patient with people, and who will treat everybody in the courtroom with respect. And that's what I would intend to do on the bench. So I would um, appreciate your consideration and your vote November 6th. Good evening. I'm Marcia Thomas. And thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. I am running for district court judge. My passion has always been public service. I have been in public service for over 20 years. I have been with the Boone County Attorney's Office for the past 21 years in district court every day. We deal with all misdemeanor cases, felony cases up to the preliminary hearing stage, trials, jury trials, mental health, Casey Law, juvenile court, as well as some small issues that I don't deal with as an assistant county attorney, but in district court they deal with some civil issues, small claims, cases up to $4,500 probate, and some other civil issues. But the bulk of district court is criminal law and that is where I have spent my career. I have been an assistant prosecutor for over 21 years. I have dedicated my career to the community and the betterment of my community. My children were raised there. I have four children. They've all attended public schools. I have 11 grandchildren. All of my grandchildren that are in school are in public schools. And I'm proud to say I am now a great-grandmother. Uh, I had my first great-grandchild on Saturday. So my family is entrenched in Boone County. They are in the community. We've played sports in the community. My husband has been involved in peewee football, baseball, basketball. My children have all played sports through the school system. The community is very important to me. I've also continued my education. Education is where we build our future. And my education has continued through the years. I not only have a Juris Doctor, I've also maintained uh, my education by getting a Master's in Science in Criminal Justice two years ago and a Master's in Science in Information Security Systems just this past May. So I continue my education just as I think we as a community should continue our children's education and it should be very important. District court is important in that as well because in juvenile we deal with some of those issues. And I think that if we can deal with them in that system first, we won't see them in the adult system. So on November 6th, I certainly would appreciate your vote. Thank you. My name is Keith McMain. I'm running for district judge also. Um, I am a lifelong Northern Kentuckian. Um, grew up in Erlanger, now I live in Burlington. I've been in private practice for 29 years, practicing law. My office has always been in Boone County, but I've practiced law in probably about 20 to 25 at least different counties in the state of Kentucky. And I see that as an advantage coming in as a district judge because I've seen 
how a lot of different counties and a lot of different judges run their dockets, how they um, you move their cases along and different things like that. I am very rooted to the community. Um, I see this position as a further step in my service to the community. I am on the board of the Burlington Fire Protection District in Burlington. I'm on the board of the RC Dur YMCA. I am currently the assistant track coach at a middle school. I am a assistant cross country coach in another program. Um, I have coached soccer for 15 years in the Boone County Youth Soccer Association. So I have been um, rooted in my community and very involved in the community my entire adult life. I have practiced law not only in the criminal area of the district court, but in all the areas of the district court. I've done eviction practice, uh, defending evictions for people, and I've represented apartment complexes in evictions. I've done probates from petitions to dispense with administration for $1 million estates. I've done adult mental health and disability jury trials in four different counties. I've also done criminal defense work. I've done uh, traffic cases. Everything that the district court does, there's nothing that I have not done in my 29 years. And there's nothing that I have not done in my 29 years in multiple counties in the state. I believe education is very important for everybody. Um, obviously, all of us here believe education is important because we all got a master's degree. Um, whatever I can do as a district judge to help the school system, I'm going to do that. I do not see myself as a Boone County, and I see myself, at, if I win this position, as a Boone Gallatin district judge. And I will give Gallatin County as much priority as Boone County. You will not be a second class citizen with me. I have already met with the sheriff, the jailer, the clerks, and different people talking to them about the court system and what problems they see and what things we may be able to implement should I be elected. I would um, ask you for your vote on November 6th, and I appreciate all of you being here. I want to give a thanks to everyone who has provided really in-depth um, introductions. Thank you, guys. Um, I see several people in the audience with notes and things like that. I told you I'd like to run this a little casually. So can I get a show of hands? I'm a teacher, so I do this a lot. Can I get a show of hands from everybody if you have a question that you would like to have read since you've taken the time out? Um, I'd like your questions to be read since you're here. Got one. Okay. Um, with that, I will, I'm going to allow time for that question, but as I promised the candidates, I would go through a couple of the pre-submitted questions. I did send out an email um, late or early last week, and we had a few community members submit some questions. So I'm going to read directly from those questions, and then um, due to my own misunderstanding, I'm going to allow them to inform us all of which judge is going to handle that question because um, obviously they have different roles and responsibilities that I'm not entirely familiar with. So um, we've made a little bargain up here that that's agreeable. All right, I'm going to go ahead and start. This one's a little bit longer, so I'll get the long question out of the way first. With the passing of Senate Bill 200 in 2014, it has become increasingly difficult for a DPP to enforce compulsory attendance laws, especially with students that are 13 to 18 years of age. Several of our students have been involved with the CDW and have multiple trailers by the time they are, they are before a judge. Our schools have also exhausted our resources, such as our school resource officer, youth service center, and our in-house professional counselors who work with these students every day. With that being said, as a school district, we are unable to effectively handle the discipline of students who are truant or who have behaviors that are beyond our control. So the question is, what can our judges do to help us keep students in school and be accountable for their behaviors so that we can provide all other students with a culture that is safe and conducive to learning? Is that an all-call question? Kind of seems like it overlaps a little bit. Okay. Um, anybody like to start? Oh, perfect. Thank you. First of all, um, 
most of you in the audience, I believe he said were educators, but a DPP that he mentioned is the Director of Pupil Personnel, and a CDW um, that he mentioned is a court designated worker. And uh, being on the board in Boone County, the school board for 12 years, they use acronyms all the time. So they're always having to tell me. So I just thought I would share that with you guys before I jump into my answer here. Um, so as a family court judge, I would first like to say, through my experience with the school board, truancy comes from something underlying that issue for the students, whether it be depression or anxiety um, or other issues at home. So the first thing I would like to help with is trying to work with the schools and um, even the county attorney and meet and find out how we can uh, address those underlying issues and, and identify those underlying issues for each child and then be able to provide those resources. I would definitely be an advocate um, for the resources that I know we use in Boone County, and I'm not sure what all resources you use here, but whether it be North Key or Catholic Charity Services, um, there is Champions Program through the Children's Home of Northern Kentucky. Um, those programs, I would like to talk to them and try to get them to come to Gallatin County so there's no transportation issues for your students that, that might need those um, uh, services and I feel like if we have a prevention plan we could get it early and then they won't find themselves in family court um, if they do find themselves in family court I definitely would be working with the school find a prevention plan and let the students know as well as the parents after talking to them they're both going to be held accountable for being at school I, I haven't served on the school board in Boone County for 12 years because I don't believe in public education. I definitely believe in public education and that the students have to be here in the school. So I will um, definitely enforce orders and enforce the plans that we put in place for them. Um, I appreciate this question because it's something that I've been speaking to a lot of people about, especially in Gallatin. Um, you have a very significant problem um, with children in schools and being involved in juvenile court here, um, it is actually percentage-wise much higher than what Boone County's cases are. Um, and I think, and it's just a guess, I don't really actually have facts to back me up, but I believe a lot of it stems from drug problems and abuse problems that occur um, in the homes. And um, when I look at that issue, um, I have to say that that is a parenting problem because I think that a lot of people are brought up in generation after generation of um, problems in their home that just repeat themselves. So we have a lot of children who are now using drugs, whose parents were using drugs, and even sometimes their grandparents were using drugs. Um, I think that the focus doesn't really need to be at court because it obviously hasn't affected the problem in a long time. Um, I think that the focus truly has to come from a community effort to try to nip the problem in the bud and that takes leadership within the community. And that is something that I believe that a judge could participate in a judge could not run that. There's no way that would create too many conflicts of interest, but certainly a judge could help that problem by participating in a community-wide effort. I've spoken to many people in Gallatin County. They all agree that there needs to be a community effort. What they don't have is someone leading that charge. The schools are overworked. Um, clearly in your question, I mean, you're telling us that you've done everything that you can do. I know that the cabinet, I've spoke with the cabinet workers down here in Gallatin County, they're overloaded, they've done everything that they can do, and they keep doing it, and so does the school, and it's not fixing the problem. It has to come from the homes. Now, it also has to be a joint effort with family court, with district court, with circuit court, to try to, um, I guess I would say, punish appropriately when, when it's uh, called for. But there also has to be an understanding of the underlying problems. And it's, it can't just be a situation where we um, look at a child and say, well, you know, you've had all these problems, go deal with the cabinet, let the cabinet do it. The cabinet is not gonna fix this. The court is not gonna fix it. It's got to be a combined effort between all of us. We can't leave it to the schools. 
it's got to be each and every one of us working together to try to nip that problem in the bud and it's going to take a long time and a lot of work but um, that's what I really believe is the most important focus and as a judge I would always try to understand when dealing with um, offenses try to understand that it's possible that a person a child or even their parents don't know how to run a good home how to be on time how to not live a life with drugs they might not have opportunities the same that I had and I want to make sure that I look at each one of those cases and not necessarily you know send them to jail smack them on the hand whatever I want to truly try to find something that is actually going to fix the problem or correct the problem and teach them a better better way to live The U.S. Supreme Court has held that the Due Process Clause allows parents to rear their children. And they can do that any way they like as long as they're not at risk. And that's when the cabinet comes in. And I think the problem stems from children um, or parents at home not having freedom to raise their children and discipline them the way they, they should. Um, I was spanked with a belt. I was spanked with a wit, uh, switch. I would not dare say some things that uh, I have heard that children say to their parents these days, such as, I'm a child, you're not going to hit me. If children don't respect authority at home, they're not going to respect it at school or any place else. So I think that parents need to be free to parent. Um, I've also learned that several communities in Northern Kentucky have what they call police social workers. And those are social workers that are actually employed by the police department and when the police are called for an incident, be it a domestic violence or another sort of incident, the social worker goes in the next day and tries to identify a problem. Because this problem needs to be nipped in the bud, not put off on the schools, because the schools are not supposed to raise children. They're supposed to educate them. So that's what I would like to see, is parents be free to discipline their children the way that they should. Of course, you know, I don't condone child abuse, but you need to be able to discipline your children and teach them authority. I agree that it, it is a community approach and to kind of piggyback off what Greta and, and Bonnie both said, I think that it does take a community approach. My husband's an assistant principal and so he has dealt with truancy type issues and I, I know a lot of schools do. It might be a bigger problem in Gallatin even. Um, I think for a family court judge, one of the biggest things I could do would be to listen to the CDW, other people who have already done a lot of the hard work. I mean, they're on the front lines of the issue, and I, I understand that by the time it gets to family court, all so much has already happened, um, and that's sort of the last you know step in the in the line of what can be done. So. I think beyond listening and trying to work with them and partner with them on trying to come up with solutions, I also think that we have to strictly enforce the law, you know, and um, to the fullest extent of the law. If that means, you know, that people are held accountable, children te or teenagers and parents are held accountable, then they should be. And, um, you know, I, I hope that that would help, it, not everybody, it's not going to help everybody, but at least some of the students to try to turn it around and maybe start going to school, so. District court only sees truancy if there's a public offense file. But to explain to you, Senate Bill 200 was designed to alleviate the court system from status offenders. It was to take truancy beyond control out of court mandated appearances. That's what Senate Bill 200 was designed to do. The reason for that was it was to alleviate the cost associated with having to have the um, community-based programs being put there and then set out for DJJ to follow. So what they did was they designed the Senate Bill without funding because if we're going to save the money by removing the state mandated programs, then we're going to open up funds for the community 
to have programs to alleviate these problems, which I agree with these three ladies here, that it is a community-based problem. But district court will see a truancy issue from time to time, but normally it's combined with a public offense. And I disagree that it's drug-related, basically, and it's family drug-related. What I agree with is family-related. And what you see here in Gallatin County is not just Gallatin County, it's Boone County as well. You have grandparents raising children that they cannot keep up with. I mean, I'm a grandma and I don't wanna raise my grandchildren, but you have grandparents trying to force a teenage child to go to school. Grandma doesn't have the clout to do that. So then what happens is you have an assault case because grandson or granddaughter shoves grandma, things get out of control, police get called, they then hook the kid and bring him to me. I'm the juvenile court prosecutor in Boone County. I've been that for 21 years. I have seen this cycle. And until we get a community-based program where everybody's proud to be a Gallatin County high school graduate, a Gallatin County high school student, and the parents are proud to be in that system. I don't know how we're gonna combat the truancy issue because you have to start it in the community. You have to respect that you've got a school to go to, that you have parents or grandparents or aunts or uncles to help you get there. So. I believe community is so important and you can have community-based programs with judges involved only to the extent that maybe they come into court. They see what the court system is all about. They see what goes on there. They get to know the players in the courtroom. Maybe you can motivate them that they want to give back to their community and they want to be the person sitting at the table dealing with the kids that come in. So I think you have to start at the community. And I've been doing that for 20 years. I'm gonna to continue to do that. And I really wanna help all of you in Gallatin County do that as well. I would agree that um, very rarely does district court get a truancy case on its own. But um, the biggest problem with Senate Bill 200 is that as you all are aware, um, it took away the court's hammer. I mean, we have to wait until they've been adjudicated three times, or we have to wait until, you know, they have to go through this myriad of stuff at school before I ever see them. Um, and that's the problem with Senate Bill 200. I mean, to be honest with you, Senate Bill 200, in my opinion, is a big turd. And until we get the legislature to remove Senate Bill 200 or amend Senate Bill 200, kids aren't stupid. They know nothing's going to happen to them. They're going to get truancy diversion again. They're going to go through truancy diversion. They'll be a good boy or a good girl for a few weeks. And then they'll go back to being the same way they were. And then they'll get truancy diversion again. Uh, it's going to be very difficult. The only real rod that I see that I have is there is a violation that I can that parents can be charged with calling called failure to send your kids to school and it's a hundred dollar fine the first time they're guilty it's a 250 to up to a 250 dollar fine and then I can impose jail so I guess if all this stuff doesn't get the students attention then I guess as a judge, maybe I'll get, try to get the parents' attention. Um, do I think that's the perfect solution? No. I agree with all these people that it's got to be everybody working together. But by the time they get to me, a lot of people have been working with this child and with this family. And I see as a judge that if the parents aren't going to parent, then I guess I'll do my best to make them parent. Um, my hands are somewhat tied by Senate Bill 200. I'm not going to 
you all know that as administrators and teachers. I'm not going to sugarcoat that. But um, there are things that we can try and things that we can do to try to get their attention before they turn 18 and these problems continue into adult, adulthood. Passing the mic's a little difficult from end to end. Um, I want to go ahead and allow, uh, that was, I appreciate all of the, the answers. Um, I want to go ahead and allow uh, the question from the audience. That way, for timing purposes, I promised I'd try to keep this under an hour for everyone. Um, so if you'd like to come up and ask a question, um, we have a second microphone up here. Thank you all for being here. Um, I'm very passionate about the uh, opioid epidemic that is uh, facing our community. Gallatin County has the fifth highest deaths per capita in the state of Kentucky. And the opioid epidemic is uh, growing at uh, record rates and I know you're all familiar with that. So my uh, question is really for, for both sets of uh, judge candidates. As it relates to your family uh, court and your district court, what is your position on the opioid epidemic? How does your uh, position differentiate from uh, the other candidates? Uh, how will you deal in the family court with uh, the children that are impacted uh, being removed or going back with the families? And then on the district court, the repeat offenders. I hear a lot of feedback from our law enforcement that uh, the courts don't support uh, them in the field, they keep sending the same people back over and over and over. And I understand that you guys are only a part of the solution, but I'm curious what your part of the solution is as you see it. I would go back to um, Senate Bill 200. If a juvenile has um, is charged with a drug offense, that's a public offense. And under Senate Bill 200, before you can send somebody to detention for a significant period of time, they have to have be adjudicated three times, a minimum of three times. Mm -hmm. So that's not, you can have one adjudication, they can have five charges. They can have possession, trafficking, possession of drug paraphernalia, all this stuff, and that's one adjudication. Um, you know, the biggest hammer I've got is when I when they get to that level that I can put them in um, detention and if they're a repeat offender then that's where they'll end up um, there's not a whole lot else I can do you know I want to try to you're gonna have to try to put them in programs and I would say on initial adjudications that's what I would try to do is get them into some kind of program to deal with their problem and deal with their addiction but as everyone knows, most people who are addicted to something, they're going to fail two or three or four times before it really takes root with them. Um, so I don't know how much you all know about Senate Bill 200, but you know, if somebody gets picked up on a public offense, they can only be put in detention for 48 hours unless it's a weekend or a holiday before I, have, I would have to have a detention hearing to see, determine under the statute whether they can remain in detention. So. The judge's hands are somewhat tied. I know the community believes the judges aren't helping at all. But again, this bill is a horrible bill. Mm -hmm. I don't know if any of you have heard the um, advertisements or the radio discussion about the new um, drug issues that they're doing in Cincinnati and the negative ads on, you know, that the people say, oh, my son would have been saved and all the people against it are saying, you know, we're going to make all this stuff misdemeanors. And we're going to give all these people diversion and put them in programs, but we can't even make them stay in the program. And the one people are saying all the drug dealers are going to flock to Ohio because they get in trouble. They're not going to get jail. They're not going to get other things. And I mean, what really needs to happen is teachers and school administrators need to really lobby their legislators about this Senate Bill 200 because. It is just, I'm not gonna, it's just a bad bill all the way around, in my opinion. Um, and judges' hands are tied. You can't do things until 
so many adjudications or they've gone through all this stuff with truancy before they get to, to the judge and you know we need to get these kids attention while they are juveniles because I guess at least then that record is sealed when they become adults the two biggest thing that that employers hate and I've found out in my 29 years is they don't want to hire druggies and they don't want to hire thieves because they got enough problems with people stealing they don't need their own employees stealing from them and you know if they're got any kind of driving involved or anything like that if they get caught with people um, you know who fail drug tests and stuff at work it just skyrockets their insurance so those are the two major things that are going to keep those children from getting good paying jobs when they get older in life so we've got to try to get their attention while they're young Senate Bill 200 wasn't the main cause of what's going on now juvenile court most people don't like to hear this but I'm going to tell you anyway it's rehabilitative it is not punitive the juvenile code was written to rehabilitate whether I like it as a prosecutor or whether I would like it as a judge whether you like it as school administrators or parents the job of the juvenile code was to rehabilitate youth to become productive adults and that has been for over 200 years that's been the code does it need to change I think so I think there needs to be more teeth for the judge to be able to do something other than send to programs probate to parent probate to DJJ but Senate Bill 200 made that worse now they have to have prior adjudications before they can get any significant out of home placement a detention hearing has to happen in 48 hours however if they're trafficking the judge can hold them for the safety of the community and the safety of themselves the juvenile for up to however long it takes to get that case disposed of now there are programs out there that I will say are very good programs bluegrass challenge is a very good program Appalachian Academy is a wonderful program this takes kids out of the environment that perhaps is the problem <laughs> and puts them in an environment that makes them feel like they can do anything and if they succeed they come back into court we look at the charges we may amend them if they've done well and they've graduated but when you see these young people come back from this pro these programs it's yes sir yes ma'am I'm gonna go to college they even get their high school diplomas in these programs so there are programs that work we just have to get those kids there and they're voluntary so that's a problem but as a judge you can make these programs something that's appealable because maybe we set your case out as the prosecutor I do that quite often I set the case out go to Appalachian Academy if you complete that program we'll take another look at your case and see if we can get you on the road to recovery everyone's been touched by this crisis if you have not been touched by this opioid epidemic you're lucky if it's not a family member it's somebody you know it's a close friend everyone wants to find a solution and I think those types of programs are solutions in juvenile court yeah the opioid uh, crisis is devastating to our community and I agree with Marcia it's it's affecting every one of us in some way or another and in family court we see it a little differently because we deal with it when there are parents who are addicted and they're losing their children so in the dependency neglect and abuse docket which is really it's one of the reasons I think that we have a new position of family court because it has become such a problem in Boone and Gallatin counties um, with only one family court judge that in the growth of the counties um, it's been a lot for one judge to handle so it's a huge problem and I think as a family court judge you know the most important thing and, and I'm I'm an adoptive mom I've been through the foster care training 
I've helped raise a relative whose parents are were addicted. Um, so I know, you know, personal experience, I, I have it. But I, I think we have to look at it like it is a disease and it's a treatable disease. And the goal always in family court, first and foremost, is for children to be with their parents whenever possible. So that is the first goal is we try to, you know, motivate the children, give them, or not the, the, the parents, give them the services that they need to be able to, to get better. That's the ultimate goal. Um, and when that doesn't happen, the children have to be safe and they have to be protected. And right now there's over 9,000 children in the state of Kentucky in foster care. And that number just keeps growing because of the opioid addiction uh, crisis. And a lot of times we see grandparents, aunts and uncles raising uh, relatives' children because of it. So I think we need to look at it. It is a disease. It's a treatable disease first and foremost. But when a parent does not follow through and is not getting better and is not getting clean, then that child first and foremost has to be protected and has to be with a loving family that will provide care for him or her. Thank you, Jenny. Um, so I would uh, just echo what they have said as far as it, it's definitely a crisis that has hit everyone and um, keeps growing in all of our communities, unfortunately. Um, as family court, um, as Jenny mentioned, the the goal is for children to be with their parents, um, but if their parent is unable to care for them um, and it's not in their best interest and it's not safe for them, um, you know, I'm not going to be giving them back to their parent um, until that parent can prove that, that they can take care of the child and that they have been rehabilitated, as, you know, Marcia talked about. Um, there are programs out there, and um, they are voluntary programs, but there are programs out there that these parents will need to, to attend and will need to graduate from and be successful in in order to be able to provide for their children. Um, you know, safety will be the first and foremost goal for me in these cases with these kids. Um, and some type of permanency um, at pot potentially a quicker uh, path because these kids don't need to wake up every day not knowing who they're going to be with the next day. And so they need some stability and permanency in their life. And so there, there will have to be some, some sort of timeline, you know, to speed this up a little bit for them potentially so that, you know, they're not in a state of flux all the time and coming into the school system in a state of flux and, and not knowing. So. Um, I will make the parents accountable and I will keep the kids safe. Um, this, I guess this uh, circumstance is, is just, um, I don't even know where to begin with this. I, I'm, I feel like I'm going to be pretty harsh on it, in all honesty, being very fair. I don't think there's any excuse for a parent to, um, to try to live an addictive life and uh, not be held accountable. I just think that the children deserve so much more than that. So I would not be the kind of judge that would give a person chance after chance after chance to clean up their life in order to get their children back. Um, you shouldn't need but one chance at the very most and you really shouldn't need that one chance. Now I might, most likely, would have to give more than one chance but I don't see myself as a three or four or five strikes and you're out kind of person. I think I would be much harsher than that. Um, I do believe that if we're talking about other circumstances, I may be a little bit more willing um, to, um, you know, to give people some extra shots at something. Uh, it de really depends upon the effort that a person is putting in. People come to court and I've seen, all seen, multiple cases where people come to court and promise the moon and the stars and they get themselves out of court because they made a deal at the last minute that all sounded hunky-dory to everybody that was there but then they walk out of court completely abandon that do what they want and they're back in there again and the kids have been drugged all the way through that process and that is what i'm looking to avoid i don't want to give children back just like ms record said if you you need to prove that you're straight you need to prove that you're sober and that you are not going to continue with the addiction i don't see that happening in in six months like it usually you know they're usually trying to give the children back at six months 
Um, I think that because of this crisis, what I've seen, it takes a lot longer than that. Now, in um, the cases that we would be involved with, they typically, they have what they call um, reasonable efforts that they have to make for reunification. And just like Ms. Dusing said, that is the goal. We want these children to go back to their parents if their parents are available. And that's about 15 months is what they're really supposed to try to, to make it happen within. And then after that, they've got this time period where they can kind of continue to work for a little while longer, but before they can change the goal to adoption, to termination of rights and adoption. And um, it's possible when we see people who are not making any effort at all, it's possible to waive reasonable efforts and go ahead and move forward with termination of rights or with the, the not necessarily termination of rights, but to stop the reasonable efforts and not try to put the child back in the home. Now, I don't know, I haven't seen cases where that's ever happened, but I'm not saying that it hasn't. Um, I feel as though that's something that I would want to look at at times because I've certainly seen cases where we didn't need to be stringing a child along for a, a year and a half. I've also seen cases where somebody's had custody and the parent's been gone for three years and the, the parent in custody or the, the custodial temporary custodian has to keep going back every six months to see how the child's doing and there's no parent in the picture. I don't understand why we don't just stop that. Why are we making somebody who's doing this child a favor have to keep coming back, going back to court? That's not reasonable in my eyes. So I want to try to cut through some of that if I'm capable of doing that. And I don't know of any reason why I could not at this point, but I'm going to hold back a little bit and say that I'm not a judge yet. And um, there's probably still a lot more that I have to learn. I'd like to take this from a little bit different perspective. Um, when I first started my own practice in 1990, I worked for a group called Pro Kids over in Cincinnati. You probably have all heard of them. At that time, they had a contract with Hamilton County to provide attorney GALs for the uh, abuse and dependency docket. And in that position, I saw the worst of the worst, uh, the scaldings, the broken bones, and that sort of thing. And the big drug then was crack cocaine. Well, since then, uh, oh, and to back up, working with pro kids, I have spoken with numerous psychiatrists and psychologists, and it's my understanding that the kids' personalities develop by the time they're three. And once they're around three, then they start becoming, you know, I hate to use the term damaged goods, but they start having problems after problems. Well, I'm now a certified adoptive parent, and once you're in that circle, you see this large group of people who just love to adopt a child. And of course, you know, reality is, unfortunately, everyone's looking for a young child. You know, one that's not, per se, has a lot of problems. So I'm pretty uh, direct and no-nonsense with this. I would give them one chance. You know, this is your chance. Um, take advantage of it. And after that, I would you know, move forward. I think we did have one additional question from the crowd. And um, we'll have to keep the answers pretty brief. Um, but if you want to go ahead. This is a brief question that warrants, I think, a, a brief answer. Uh, from years of work in public schools and previously as a DPP, uh, I've witnessed over the years, not only in the home district where I'm from, but in the district uh, that I've visited since then, there's an issue with consistency, okay? And of course that's uh, you know, uh, assuming that judges do their part, make good choices, make good decisions, and then when the judge does not come back the next month in the cycle, and I've even seen the case where judges are not consistent with their own parenting, do this, don't do that, and my line is uh, I'll give you 30 days to quit that in, and then not follow through with what, what the individual says. But my question is really this, as, as you alternate and the other and your counterpart comes to Gallatin County, what do you think that you could do to assist with the consistency where 
whatever you have said or they have said would be followed through at the next meeting with that parent or child. I think that the case should stay with the individual judge and it should not be rotated back and forth and that way they could follow their rulings. Um, I think one of the things that I see regularly is um, something said in court and not written down anywhere and um, that causes us all, I mean you're seeing case after case after case, you forget and you have to go back and pull the video which nobody ever wants to do because we're too busy so um, to me one of the things that I've already decided I would do is try to type my notes during hearings to allow for more notes on my docket sheet which will allow for more I guess recall of what was going on and I think it's very important that when you tell somebody you've got to do this that needs to be written down so I'm I'm a big uh, person on organization and having details. Um, I would say as well that um, each case should stay with the same judge so that they're being consistent, but um, if that isn't the case, then having everything written down um, and, and being consistent with what you're saying. But I think part of your question may be, are we going to be consistent across the board in all cases? Um, and that's something, you know, as well that each case is different in their circumstances, but um, there can be some consistency in the, the path that we take and the rulings that we make so that the kids and the parents will know what, what we're expecting of them. I don't know that I have a whole lot to add to what they've said. Um, I think that it is important for one judge to stay consistent um, with their rulings to be able to keep good docket sheet uh, notes on their docket sheet so they know next time it's their case in, in court that they can enforce their prior rulings but I also think in family court I think the goal would be to have one judge assigned to one family um, so that anytime that family comes back whether it's domestic violence child abuse divorce they're gonna see the same judge and that way that judge has that prior experience with with the whole family and the whole situation I'm a note taker, so my notes would be in the file. And I think it's important, in district court especially, because they don't have specific juvenile cases that they deal with. They alternate. So each judge should keep notes in the file, should put them in the file, making sure that the other judge would be able to see what was going on in that case. Uh, and I also think that uh, the judges should communicate. Um, if uh, I'm going to have a certain uh, child follow a certain protocol and I, they're going to come back in two weeks and I may not be the judge on the bench, I want the judge that's going to be on the bench to know what I'm going to expect from this child when he or she returns. So I agree you're going to have to be a note taker and you're going to have to make sure uh, if there's another judge that hears that case, has your notes and can... Uh, follow through with your procedure I would um, I think they've pretty much said it all I mean most cases in district court and most family court cases you stay with one judge and if I'm the judge you know I'm gonna be back in Gallatin County every other week so I'm unless there's something some reason that they have to be scheduled in front of the other judge they're going to be scheduled back in front of me you know and I agree you have to take good notes, but you also have to take the time before you listen to the case and you rule on it that you look at those notes. Because in all honesty, you're not going to remember everything about every case two weeks later. So you're going to have to take the time before you rule to say, wait a second, I want to look at my notes or before the case starts, take a minute and look at your notes from the last thing so you can prepare yourself and you can say okay this child coming in he was supposed to have been signed up for this program by today he was supposed to have not missed any days at school he's supposed to have his school record from the teacher that says he's made it at, to school on time and been there every day so that you know before you ever start the case what to expect from the litigant or whatever you want to call them that's coming in the juvenile that you know 
Okay, let's start here. You were supposed to bring me a, a note from the principal that says you've been at school on time, no tardies, no misses in the last two weeks. Where's the note? Uh, that's where I would start, stuff like that. But, you know, yeah, you've got to be, you know, and to me it's just like being a parent, you know. If you keep telling your son, clean up your room, clean up your room, make your bed every morning, but you never ever enforce it, they're never going to do it. So if you say something, then you've got to be willing as a judge to enforce it so that that child knows you're serious about it. Uh, one big complaint I have with Kentucky State Courts is that there are notes taken. Uh, having been trained in federal court, a court speaks through its orders, written orders, and they're not in effect until they're written, they're signed, and they're entered. I think everything should be in an order. That way the parties have copies of it, everyone knows what's going on, and everyone's in the same you know, ballpark with it. Uh, the written notes are too confusing. Also in family court here, they often have attorneys draft the orders, and that turns into a nightmare, too, that goes on for a month or two because the attorneys can't agree on the language in the order. I think the judge needs to draft the order right then when the order comes out, have it drafted, signed, enter it, and give it to the parties. That way everybody's got a copy of it, everybody knows where they stand and what they need to do. I'm sorry, I have to follow up on that. In juvenile court, you don't have time to draft orders. You don't have time to um, to issue things out through through the attorneys or anything like that. The cases go like this, and, and you might not even get but five minutes on a case. Um, so you have to do as much as you can in as, as little amount of time, and they use the docket sheet as the order for that court. So, um, I mean, there are some cases that really, we do draft specific orders, and those happen, but from week to week, uh, when we're going back for different uh, different hearings in that case, many times we use the docket sheet as that order, and it's just out of time necessity. So I want to thank everyone um, for their participation in this and also for your attendance as well. Um, i got one question everybody can answer with a simple, just one word. All right. Argus Davis, how many times do you all think that uh, – Hearing should be postponed. How many times do you think an attorney should be able to come to a court system and keep postponing a case and putting it off and putting it off? And you all can answer each one of you with just one word. I'll start with one. One per attorney, I guess. It's, it's unfortunately, that's the way it has to be. I would echo one per attorney because there is an attorney on each side if there's special circumstances you have to have. One per attorney? One per attorney? One. There we go. We all agreed on something tonight. Um, so again, thank you everyone. The most important part about this was not attending tonight, but actually going out and voting, informing your friends, your family, your community members um, that not just these two races, but they're all pretty significant. So go out and vote. And again, thank you everyone for attending. <laughs>